Hello everybody, I'm Gareth. Welcome along to the Somewhere on Earth podcast and it's Tuesday the 11th of June 2024 where we are in our studio here in London. And with us is journalist Pete Guest. Again, two weeks running. Hello, Pete. Are you still well? I'm still well. It's always nice to to be in a bunker with you underground. Yes, here we are. Our our Tuesday date in in a little bunker somewhere. Now, just before we get into the main part of the programme, I found something interesting this week. Found out something interesting. Right. You look intrigued. Mm -hmm. So, this is, when it comes to mis- and disinformation... Who the big super spreaders of this stuff are? You know, what kind of demographic, male versus female and so on? Do you know what I found? Is it pensioners? You got it. Do you know what kind of pensioner? What sex? So I seem to remember working on stuff in South and Southeast Asia a couple of years ago that it was was kind of late late middle-aged and pension-aged women mostly were spreading stuff. You got it. Right, yeah. you, you turn out to be right. Yeah, there we are. I, which was news to me because I might have thought it would be more like your younger kind of teenage bloke, possibly. Shows that I was wrong. Because um, Roger Rowe has picked this up, by the way. He's read it in an Ars Technica article. And um, yeah, this is about who the spread, super spreaders really are when it comes to false information. Uh, this is researchers who've been studying the most misinformation filled social media networks and who the most prolific sharers are. They looked at a whole load of Twitter accounts associated with US based voters. And in their sample, just 0.3% of accounts were responsible for sharing 80% of the links to fake news. And uh, yeah, it turned out to be older female users who are rather prone to clicking the retweet button on false information. Pete would have known that already, but it surprised me. There we are. It may have surprised you, dear listener, but um, if you're in that demographic, tell us what you think, if you want. Should we be blaming grandma for misinformation? Might seem a bit harsh, mightn't it? Love to hear what you have to say. Here we go. And also coming up today, we focus our technology lens on the environment in the top half of this podcast, specifically how you might think, um, things that you might think are eco-beneficial might not necessarily be, because Myanmar is paying a rather high environmental cost for the surging global uptake of electric vehicles and other supposedly low or no carbon emitting technologies. And in other news, we'll hear from you, including lots of your thoughts and comments. We may even have some subscriber numbers to dish out as well. So we might find out why Stefano cares so much about the number 19. It's all right here on the Somewhere on Earth podcast. First, though, growing demand for electric vehicles and wind turbines might be good for emissions, but there is an environmental cost as well. Regions, habitats and livelihoods in Myanmar are facing significant damage because the surge in demand for permanent magnets is driving up mining for rare earth materials and elements. A report just out from Global Witness has been painting this worrying picture. Well, with us now is Mike Davis, Global Witness's CEO. Thanks for coming in, Mike. Thanks for having me. Hello. And this follows on from previous work in 2022. It's like an ongoing investigation, isn't it? Yeah, this is our second report on the rare earths mining in this conflict-affected corner of northern Myanmar. Um, We've actually been reporting on illicit economies in that region for about 20 years, but it's the second one on the explosion in the mining of these heavy rare earths. And when we talk about these heavy rare earths, we're talking about them going into permanent magnets being a big basis for the manufacture of those. So before we find out about the environmental problem, let's just find out about the materials themselves, so rare earth elements and uh, permanent magnets. Yeah, so heavy rare earth elements, as they're known, uh, include these types of metals called terbium and dysprosium, which are much sought after for use in permanent magnets, which are a very strong kind of magnet, which are used in all kinds of devices, but they're particularly crucial to the manufacture of uh, EVs and also wind turbines. They are largely made, over 90% 90 of them are made in China, 
and there is a, a concentration of the production of these permanent magnets in the hands of just a couple of firms, which then in turn supply all kinds of quite well-known international manufacturers of uh, electric vehicles and, and also wind turbines. We're talking major car manufacturers of the sort of Tesla Volkswagen variety, uh, major manufacturers of wind turbines like uh, Siemens Gamesa, for instance. Mm. So people who are driving an electric vehicle, there's a reasonable chance that they, they, they'll certainly have some of these materials in the car, but a reasonable chance that they may have or- originated from Myanmar? Yes, at the moment, there's a very high probability that if you're driving an electric vehicle recently manufactured, it will contain these heavy rare earths that come from Myanmar. And let's go to the region that you've been working in and investigating. This is Kachin State, isn't it? So it's near the border with China. Yes, Kachin State is the state which borders China. It's up in the north of Myanmar. It's very rich in different natural resources. Jade uh, is a huge source of revenue, which mostly goes to the wrong people. There's also amber and timber as well. And it's the scene of one of the longest running conflicts in Myanmar. There's been uh, an insurgency against central government control since the early 1960s. And in fact, one of the main protagonists in the rare earth mining boom has been around for as long as there's been that conflict. And the mines themselves, then, you've been identifying them and I guess giving a sense of the, the, the extent of their production. For one thing, how have you been finding them? Because you, you, I mean, this is a very difficult region to operate in. So are you relying on satellite imagery mainly? Yes, to, to do this investigation, we're using a combination of satellite imagery and doing very detailed analysis on that to such a fine-grained degree that we can identify these particular collection pools, which are actually quite small, where the, the residue from the, the drilling and, and leaching operation collects and is then transformed into these rare earths. We also use some on-the-ground undercover investigation with partners, and we crunch a lot of trade data as well. Do you have access to local people in the region? You mentioned you have people working undercover, so that is part of their work, meeting up with people in communities, maybe even mine workers themselves, and hearing from them. Yeah, we think it's really important that we get the perspective and and the aspirations, the agenda of local people across in our reporting. So a big part of what we're doing is, is trying to get that human story over. And that does indeed include testimony from people who, by force of circumstance, have to work in these mines to earn a living. They are particularly exposed to the polluting effects of using these rather toxic chemicals with minimal protection. So what have you found then? What we found is that there's been this explosion in the mining of these particular heavy rare earth elements in a a really small area. It's about the size of Singapore, where most of it goes on. It's an area which is controlled by a warlord who is aligned with the military junta, which staged a coup in 2021. And this warlord controls uh, the territory through revenues from activities like um, the heavy rare earth mining. The mining is entirely illegal. It's not licensed properly. Um, the, the warlord's regime, if you can call it that, has no regulatory oversight. Um, and what it involves is the drilling of bore shafts into hills and small mountains. These are then pumped with chemicals, ammonium sulfate. And after that, there's this rather crude process whereby the effluent, which comes back out of the, the drill shafts, is then collected in these rather crude ponds. Um, And the separation process of getting out the heavy rare earths involves using uh, an acid called oxalic acid. And what we found is that the proliferation of these mining sites has got to an extent that it's gone up by about 40 percent just in the past two years. This corner of Myanmar is now the world's leading exporter of these heavy rare earth elements. And the trade last year was worth about $1.4 billion. And by our calculations, about 41,700 tonnes of heavy rare earth elements were taken from Myanmar and shipped into China. Good grief. Well, let's get some reaction from Pete Guest, who's been listening to this, and you've been reading these findings as well, haven't you, Pete? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, I spent a fair amount of my life looking down supply chains. And I guess to break the fourth wall a bit and, and, and think about the impact of the work that, that we tend to do as journalists, that one of the biggest problems that we have tracking this kind of story, particularly where it goes across borders, is figuring out who knows what and where and how to trace this back to a decision that feels impactful to a consumer. And I think it's interesting, you, you know, you're naming, naming you know, EV companies and saying you know, it's quite likely there's a high probability 
But the reality, the mineral supply chain feels really opaque, right? Particularly where it leads into China. There's middlemen, there's aggregators, there's launderers. It feels like a black box. And all of this material goes in. It's legitimate. It's criminal. It's associated with human rights abuses, environmental destruction. It comes out the other side. It's not quite laundered, but it's beige enough that you can get away with it. And as a journalist, you can't then go and knock on the door of Volkswagen or Tesla or a Japanese car maker and say, look, you're buying from this mine, so you're responsible for this. It's much more nebulous than that. So, so I guess my question is, how do you get around that plausible deniability side of it? And like, how do you create that sense of accountability for a company to say, well, you, you own this supply chain? Yeah, well, you're right about the challenges, but we don't actually think there's a lot of scope for plausible deniability here because in contrast with some of the other illicit trades which go on um, along that border, um, this one is really concentrated once you get just a little way down the supply chain in a very small number of pairs of hands at the risk of stretching the metaphor because you've got there just two uh, Chinese uh, rare earth mining company groups which are now permitted by the Chinese government to extract and process these heavy rare earths. Now, they, of course... Um, having processed these materials, go on to to sell them to a wide variety of customers. But there is this particular demand from the manufacturers of the the permanent magnets that we were talking about earlier, these these components for EVs and wind turbines. And there you've got two huge Chinese companies which are producing them. And they are pretty much the only game in town. So you can can go through their uh, company reports, their, their proper companies. They publish these things and you can pick out lists of their buyers from there and you can also as we've done track shipments from for instance jl mag to um tesla sites in in california so we we have to be careful we are mostly based in the uk which is a splendid jurisdiction for suing people for defamation um so we always write what we call opportunity to comment letters to these companies uh, before we publish um, and we're careful about how we present our findings. But yeah, from what we can tell, there is an overwhelming likelihood that, for instance, um, a Tesla car that was manufactured last year would contain permanent magnets, which are very, very, very likely to contain heavy rare earth elements from this corner of Kachin State. Mm. And I mentioned we have contacts with the companies. That actually includes the um, the Chinese ones. Uh, and we were actually quite encouraged that we did at least get a response from one of them, the China um heavy rare earths group um which said a bunch of things which may turn out to be you know lacking in any sort of real sincerity or commitment but they did make some of the right noises about taking this seriously investigating their supply chains and one thing that helps us here a little bit is that chinese companies and chinese regulators know what this problem looks like because China itself used to be the epicenter of the mining of these heavy rare earth elements, and they experienced firsthand what a hideously polluting, contaminating business it is. You might say, oh, well, come on, it's China. I mean, the Chinese authorities wouldn't, wouldn't take action on that, would they? But actually, in the end, they did. This um, mining was largely concentrated in uh, Jiangxi province till around 10 years ago, and it was so polluting And the costs of the clear up were so massive that the Chinese authorities basically said, that's enough. You're not doing that anymore. What happened next, which no doubt was not not their intention, was that the uh, Chinese rare earth processing firms effectively offshored the industry and said, oh, well, I've got a bright idea. There's a similar geological um, profile to some of this terrain in this lawless area of northern Myanmar. So we'll just send a load of Chinese technicians and workers illegally over the border and they can do it there instead. And that's what happened. Yeah, and, and that's what we're seeing. And we should say those companies that you named, they're not here to give their side of the story. And as you say, you know, you've approached some of them and they are giving the, in inverted commas, right noises and their concern about the environment and the, you know the, the, the harms and what have you. But um, I was interested in the supply chain aspect because I'm quite struck in your report about how much detail you go into about the supply chain, which, I mean, breaking it down very basically is the mm. mining is going on in Myanmar, but the processing is still going on in China, isn't it? Stay with us. We'll be right back. AI is changing the game of business. Will you be on the winning team? I'm Jordan Wilson, the host of the Everyday AI podcast and your coach to help you learn the X's and O's of AI. Artificial intelligence isn't just a new player in the game, it's a new sport altogether. So if you don't quickly put AI into play, your competitors will run up the score. I've spent my whole life building winning teams from coaching basketball to working with big players like Nike and Jordan brand. My next move, 
helping you win with Everyday AI. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or on everydayaipodcast.com. Let's tap into AI together and put points on the board. Yes, the, the processing is all in China. And then the next stage of the supply chain to manufacture these magnets is, is also entirely in China. Of course, one of the things that's changing is that while at the moment it makes sense for, for us and you know journalists like, like Pete to concentrate on your Teslas and Volkswagens and Fords and Nissans and Toyotas is that China itself is a massive manufacturer of EVs. And so actually from the point of view of bringing about a long-term change, we all need to work really hard to engage with decision makers in China as well, which is not easy, but but neither is it impossible. And that's a big part of our strategy as an organization. All right. Well, we'll leave it there for now. We're going to hang on. We'll get you back in for the podcast extra um, subscription version uh, if you're if you're happy to, Mike. But for now, uh, Mike Davis, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Now for something entirely different. Let us run the bath and see those soap suds foaming on the bath. Yes, indeed, dear listener. It is time. Finally, we've been promising it for ages. We haven't got round to it. Here we are. Here goes. It is finally an opportunity to grant you some subscriber numbers. Uh, so you suggest a number and we ascribe it to you. I put it in my... Um, in my blockchain-enabled database, which is actually a shared spreadsheet on a drive. But never, never mind all that. Um, before we hear that, I'm going to keep the suspense going just for a little bit longer, because before we hear the listeners' subscriber numbers, I think it's only polite, seeing as Mike's in the studio. He's come all the way, giving up quite a chunk of a Tuesday evening when you could be doing something, I'm sure, far more leisurely and enjoyable. And you're here with us. We would, if you would like to partake, off, we would like to offer you a number. Would you? Do you have a number in mind, Mike, that means something to you? Yes, I'm going to go for 24. Oh, right. Okay. And why? Uh, that's because I was 24 when I met my wife and her birthday is also on the 24th of August. That, oh, that's nice. Yeah, lots of any. So just a good number all round, isn't it, really? You know, it's just... It's not too long, it's easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's quite catchy uh, <laughs> if, you, if you find numbers uh, catchy necessarily, which uh, people don't. So let's just see. I'm just going to double check on the database here that we don't already have uh, that number ascribed. So we've already approved the number 1024, but I can't see the 24 on here. No, nope. um, it's so from that point of view, we can go ahead, but only if we get approval from Anya and uh, Pete. Yeah, I'm good with that. Yeah, I'm, okay. I, I'm looking over your shoulder, Gareth, just to make sure. We yeah, don't, so we don't you have any mistakes like we've there. had before. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that looks good. Uh, what about you, Pete? Can we go for that? Yeah, seems good to me. I've, right. I've not been keeping track. Mike Davis is subscriber number uh, 24, and this really means a lot to, to Pete, I can tell. He's, he's, a, he's all over this. Um, might we do another, seeing as this is incredibly good fun? Do you want me to do another one, Anya, or do you have one there? Well, uh, I have Steve Clark here. Uh, who? No, actually, you were going to do that one. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, because Steve's a, a, a good mate. That's not just why we're giving him a number, by the way. But uh, it's... <laughs> Well, listen, I've got a few here, and I'll just run through them, because we have got quite a few. David Said, I would quite fancy 255, as I am an 8-bit sort of person in favour of O-base indexing. Nice. Tim Harrison, I request 13. The shirt number of Wayne Pierce, the captain of Balmain Tigers in 1989, and also the shirt number of GB hockey gold medalist Sean Curley. Clearly a sports fan. Indeed. And Brian Reed, if available, could I lay claim to number 903? Because many years ago, I learned to code on an Elliot 903 in Royal Liberty School under the awesome tutelage of Bill Broderick. So, well, do I get, seeing as you read those out, do I get a chance to give any votes on these? Oh, of course. Because remember, they have to be approved. I'm just going to say yes to all of those. Good. Do, do Mike and Pete agree? I can see Pete's completely glazed over. No. And Big rubber stamp. Yep. Yes to everything. Good. Okay. Here comes Steve Clarks. He says, I'd like number um, 65535, um, which is also 2 to the power of 16 minus 1. And Steve wants this number because he said it limited a lot of his early computing efforts. Um, and just to, for a bit of context on this, because this is a particularly, I suppose, maths nerd or computing nerd number, which is personally why I love it so much. But um, this number, 6553, Three five occurs frequently in the field of computing because 2 to the power of 16 minus 1, which is the highest number that can be represented, as we all know, by an unsigned 16-bit binary number. 
Thanks, Wikipedia. Can we uh, offer that one to Steve? Yep, that sounds good to Great. me. Great. Okay, lovely. So Steve has that one. Who wants to go next? So uh, we have subscriber, uh, Stefano Gazzali, I hope I'm saying that right, says, how about 1999? My reasoning being that as a kid, I really liked Prince, and this is a reference to his famous song, but also 1999 was the year the millennium bug was supposed to kick in and apparently wreck computers around the world. It's nice to miss the millennium bug. It's like a more innocent era of apocalypse. Gosh. <laughs> we're definitely a bit older than Pete, aren't we, Gareth? Yes, the millennium bug was the biggest thing we had to worry about. I remember Those there were, the were people sleeping overnight in the BBC Radio Science Unit offices on that evening, just in case the whole of the newsroom went down. Whoa. And they slept in the science... Why, why the science unit? They could have slept anywhere in the building. They probably could, but I, I believe they were in the science unit, yes. No? That's, I never knew that. That's good yes. BBC gossip. Thank it you is. for that. It is. Um, so, <laughs> I don't, it's... Uh, yeah, and it kind of... Um, yeah, interesting memories from there. Uh, Mike, uh, you look far too young, but do you have any memories of the Millennium Bug and that build-up to it in 1999 when we heard, I mean, these ridiculous reports that aeroplanes would fall out of the sky and stuff like that? Yeah, I do. And I must have been so sort of paralytic with terror that I can't actually remember what my coping strategy was. Um, But I think like many people, I have a sort of sense of fizzle Mm -hmm. after all the hype. Yeah. So probably just to very calmly just check whichever computer you're working on to see if it just stored the year in a four-digit form and you thought, good, it does, no worries. Well, maybe probably. I hadn't discovered computers yet. No, <laughs> Fair play. Um, let's do this one from uh, Simon. So he was a loyal listener to Digital Planet, which is the forerunner to this podcast, apparently since 2008. And um, and he's very happy that we've returned to the pod waves with Somewhere on Earth. Um, would like to request the listener number 323. Simon says, this is what I believe the estimated average CO2 level was in parts per million when I was born in 1968. This is Simon speaking, not me, by the way. He says it's forecasted to be over 420 this year, which is a scary increase of 30% in just 56 years. And um, I hear the rate is accelerating, continues Simon. It is, I'm afraid. And uh, he also says that it was only 370 in the day when Go Digital, Stroke Digital Planet was born. That would have been in 2001. So if anyone's losing track of the numbers, so 323, so that was the average parts per million CO2 in 1968. By 2001, it was 370 and forecast to be over 420 this year. And Simon credits the ourworldindata.org website for that information. Uh, Simon, that was a particularly serious request, which makes me want to grant it immediately. But uh, how about Anya? Indeed, indeed. Very sobering. Yeah. Okay. Simon gets that one as well. Thank you, Simon, for that. Any more for any more? Well, should we move on to some listener comments? And then we can come back to uh, subscriber numbers in another episode, can't we? Sure. Yep. You're the producer stroke editor, so basically you're the boss. So we'll do it your way. And we have that on tape. (laughs) You do. (laughs) That's going to be your ringtone now. Um, (laughs) It is. Now, Sam Quinn in Australia. Sam is such a writer, emailer, contactor. Thank you very much, Sam, for all your questions and comments. He said, brilliant episode. Best yet, in my opinion, about the Indian election. Production quality, also very good. So thank you for that. He says, the discussion and analysis of the use of AIs for voice replication in different languages in the Indian election was superb. I actually saw huge benefits benefits for communicating in different languages rather than just the negatives. It's a complex topic and the show covered it brilliantly. One thought though, Gareth, you're no longer at the BBC, so we'd love to hear more of your opinions. My opinions? Like anybody cares what I think. <laughs> well, I, did, I did have thoughts on it. I do have to say that Sam did message today. Well, he posted on Facebook as well. He said you went on a bit about forms in last week's show. Oh, or really? the week before, yeah. Oh, well, fair. well Sam, Sam is entitled to his opinion. Sam has an opinion. I like Sam's opinion. Good or okay. bad, we want to hear from you. Whatever yeah, you indeed. want, whatever you in say. Fact, I don't take it as a criticism against me. It's just it, it could have been better edited by you, Anya. Well, so there is if that If you thinned too. it down a bit, then he too. wouldn't be complaining. Gosh. I think you would say if I hadn't rambled on in the first place and we wouldn't have well, an issue. Is really. This is how we roll on this podcast. So what do I think about the Indian elections? Well, you, you know, I suppose what struck me is that the politicians found there to be some benefit from these voice clone fakes that you may have thought the politicians would be horrified that people are going out there cloning their voices in lots of different ways. But of course, if the message that had been cloned happens to be um, useful to or sympathetic to a candidate, they were going, yeah, never mind, that wasn't my real voice. But if it gets me more votes, who cares? I think if I can (laughs) sum up 
what the uh, sentiments were there, and I just thought that was very interesting. And mm, Peter's yeah. ominously quiet. Well, we've already discussed libel laws in this in this podcast, so it's probably best I am, isn't it? Far. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, and if you want my opinion on something else, I think that anybody who plays anything through the speaker on their phone on the train, whether it's a conversation, listening to a podcast, or music, should be arrested immediately. There you go. You wanted an opinion. It's what I think. It's tech related. You may not like it very much, but I'm, it makes me cross. I actually agree with you on that one. Agreements breaking out. My goodness. <laughs> I wonder what the listeners think. And there is one more one more comment I would like to, to, to mention. Um, and this is a bit of an off-the-record email that we got from, uh, a, again, a regular subscriber. Whenever AI technologies are mentioned in the podcast, whether it's ChatGPT, MidJourney, open source software, or medical systems, I would deeply appreciate SOAP clarifying where the system's training data came from and whether it was consensually obtained and appropriately licensed. And if that information isn't available or if there are credible allegations about its provenance, listeners should be reminded of that. Please continue championing algorithmic justice and equity. Good point. Very good point, actually. Yeah. And if we don't do it, please please remind us. But we should be doing that. We should be finding out where the AI source is coming from. Yeah, exactly. Because it's the kind of thing that we would want to hold somebody to account over if we were interviewing them. So it's only fair that we apply those standards to ourselves. Hmm. Indeed. Yeah. And I was only joking about your editing. Sorry for rambling on about forms last week, everybody, including Anya. And um, sorry, by the way, Stefano, that we made you wait absolutely ages for your listener number. But thanks for the polite reminder. Um, good. There we are. Have we got any more for any more? Or is that pretty much it for now? Oh, I don't know. I've got, I've got sheets here. Hang on a minute. Um, Richard, by the way, I would like to claim four pi. Please to match my number in that previous life. The unit of solid angle in spheres or something. Should we just give him a yes? I think yes. A, a quick yes. And Michael Lundgren, this is the final one. I would like to request the number 28 as it is my birthday date, which also happens to be a perfect number. That is 28 equals 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14, which are the proper factors excluding 28 itself. There you go. A perfect soap sud number. Oh, that's really nice. And I did like Richard's as well. Four pi. I think it references four pi steradian, which is a bizarrely was a recurring theme back in the digital planet days. Oh, the fun we had. I think it's time we went. I wonder why they cancelled it. OK, here we go. It's time we went, isn't it? So here come the credits. Anya is the producer and editor of this podcast. She's right here. Pete is our excellent uh, expert contributor today. And, of course, we've heard uh, from Mike in the studio with us as well, who's going to be with us in a few moments for the podcast extra. Dylan has been doing the sound for us today here at Lanson's Team Farner, and our production coordinator is Liz Teary. I'm Gareth. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.